thanks for joining us. Welcome everyone to today's webinar, What Financial Institutions Need to Know About the Changing Definition of Non-Public Information. I'd like to introduce today's presenters. Joining us is Scott Giordano, VP of Data Protection at Spherian. Scott's a highly regarded data privacy attorney with over 20 years of experience. Also joining us is Michael Giordano, Principal Security Architect at DynTech. Michael is a program manager for cybersecurity compliance and automation. He specializes in defensive networking and information governance and has over 15 years of hands-on industry experience. Welcome Scott and Michael, please take it away. Wonderful, thank you, Abby. So what are we gonna talk about this hour? A lot of things, and um, fortunately I'm gonna talk really fast, so I ask all of you to forgive me from the get-go here. We're gonna talk about non-public information under GLBA and also under NYC Part 500. Even if you're not subject to Part 500, it's still very relevant and I'll show you why. Also talk about the expanding definition of PII uh, under US federal law, GDPR, CCPA, and a couple of other states and show how that definition has expanded over time. And then Mike will talk about Dynetech's perspective on all this. We'll do a sample data inventory and give you some conclusions and a summary. Also, as uh, Abby mentioned, please send in your questions. If we don't get to them, I'll post all the answers to all the questions on the website, on our website in about a week or so. So um, stay tuned for that. So let's go to the next slide, Abby, and uh, why this presentation? What's remarkable is that it's been 20 years since GLBA, the Graham Leach Bliley Act passed Congress, and I remember it very vividly because I was in the privacy business, in a sense, way back when, when I worked for LexisNexis, I worked in the public records division. So this was a big deal when it came out, and a lot has changed. We have two spheres of personal information. We have non-public information, which is things that are related to the financial services industry, and we have regular personal information, which can be just about anything, and unfortunately nowadays, it just about anything is. So data protection success really requires two things. One, locating both types of these information um, categories in your information ecosystem, that means inside and outside your organization, and conducting periodic assessments and audits. Before I joined the team here at Spiron, I spent about two years doing assessments and audits, and what's remarkable is that for every data store I found with clients, we found two more that we didn't know about. So uh, that's what's remarkable is when you start digging, you never know what you're gonna find. Let's go to the next slide, Abby. If you leave with nothing else, there's a couple things that we want you to lead with. One is that data privacy and security have merged into one discipline called data protection. If you've been on our webcast before, you've, you've heard me talk about this. This is something that the European Union has been doing since 1995 with the data protection directive. So we're doing it as well here now in the US. Uh, the definitions of NPI and PII are expanding to the point where they're effectively gonna be the same sooner rather than later. So now is a good time as any to talk about this. Um, professionals, that's all of you that are on the call here, are being asked to approach data protection really from, at a, from a holistic perspective, but really two different directions. One from a security direction, so the traditional CIA, confidentiality, integrity, availability, and then the R, the redundancy that PR is, has mandated, and then from a privacy standpoint, meaning a legal standpoint, uh, what can you do legally with the data that you already have? So for all these things, data inventory is a starting point. You really have to have a very good idea of where the data is, otherwise everything else is pointless. So that's what we'd like you all to leave with. And let's go to the first slide here. Much has changed since GLBA. We take it for granted almost that we've had smartphones, it seems like forever, but in fact, they're only about 10 years old. Uh, and in fact, Google didn't start selling advertising or keyword related advertisements until about 2000. So 19 years ago. It's amazing how far we've come in a short time. Facebook didn't even start until 2004, YouTube the year after. Cloud computing, we take that for granted. That didn't come out, at least from an Amazon standpoint, until 2006. iPhone, 2007, and U.S. government issuing the uh, first uh, RFID passports in 2007 as well. So it's amazing how much new types, if you will, of personal data have come on the scene since GLBA. Let's go to the next slide, Abby. And so different kinds of information that just was never contemplated back then. Advertising IDs, since uh, obviously if there was no advertising to speak of in 1999, then advertising IDs were not a thing. GPS information, even though it existed, really was not something you could utilize easily back then. 
IMA and IMZ and other numbers associated with cell phones. Again, not easily utilizable back then. Um, I remember I had one of those Nokia 5150s back then, and uh, there was just there was no way to really utilize that information easily because there was no smartphones. Biometric information, things like that, just were not easily utilizable to the degree they existed at all. And now all kinds of personal information are now newly relevant. So medical information was relevant even back then. It's newly relevant now. HR, professional personnel information, was relevant back then. It's newly relevant, as we'll see why in a bit. Let's go to the next slide, Abby. So non-public personal information, NPI, this is under GLBA. I presume all of you on the call are from the financial service industry. You're all well-versed with this. But I'll just point out a couple things here because we're going to see these themes again. Uh, GLB talks about information that in, and an individual gives you, their name, their address, their SSN, perhaps most importantly at this point, information you get about them from a transaction that uh, is in connection with your financial product. So it could be the, the, the account numbers, the payment history, debit, credit card purchases, and then information you get about them in conjunction or in connection with providing the service. So things from court records or consumer reports. This is all from the FTC's website, as I've cited towards the bottom. These things are all things you're all well-versed with. Let's go to the next slide and talk about uh, a little bit more, though. So now Part 500. And again, you may not all be subject to Part 500, but this is important. They've broken up personal data into two big categories. Uh, Non-public information now is either, number one here, business-related information that is essentially intellectual property. They call it about, uh, they say tampering with it will have an adverse impact on the business. What they really mean is intellectual property that's being stolen potentially by competitors, either here in the U.S. or overseas. And we see this in the news with regularity. This is why it was called out separately. And then we have item two, which is simply a clone of what the FTC mandated on the previous slide. And if we go to the next slide, we have a couple new categories. And they're new in the sense that you've seen them before. So item three, any information with respect to health care provisions. This is all from HIPAA, not surprisingly. So this is not new, but it may be new for you from a financial services perspective. And then finally, the kitchen sink. Any information that could be used to distinguish or trace an individual's identity, information that's linked or linkable, used for marketing purposes, passwords, authentication. So here they're just throwing in everything, folks. So as a practical matter, just about anything that you can use to identify someone is non-public information under part 500 so they've really expanded this let's go to the next slide so comparing them from a 30,000 foot view what's important is that under part 500 information that's critical to your business such as ip or even confidential information so think about information that may be with respect to someone that you're funding perhaps that you've given loans to a startup and uh, they have some cutting edge technology to the degree you've done a review of that technology and have copies of that information within your organization, that's going to be relevant. Healthcare information is very easy to exploit and it's very valuable vis-a-vis -vis regular personal information like a, a social security number. And then information that can be used to trace someone's identity. So this is something that's called out on many statutes, not just here under Part 500. And this is essentially going to be a standard definition anywhere you go, whether it's California, whether it's New York, whether it's other places, you're going to find that's a standard definition of personal information. Let's go to the next slide, and we'll dig a little deeper here. So Office of Management and Budget, OMB, these are the, think of this as a privacy think tank for the federal government. You would think that you would have the NSA or some other three-little agency like the FTC that's really in charge of privacy, but in terms of, of policing privacy, if you will, that's OMB. And so they created this definition of personally identifiable information. And just as an editorial comment, I think that we're going to be moving away from this whole idea of PII because it's so limited. And, and here it says that it's a name, social security number, biometrics, information that's linked or linkable. So that, that's still a, a, a relevant component, date and place of birth. So these are things that we all traditionally appreciate as personally identifiable information. But that's changed. Now, if you go to the next slide, OMB updated this in 2017. And so now they've added things like places of employment, identity documents, precise location information, medical history. So remember I mentioned earlier that that's newly relevant. You can see why. And biometrics. So they've updated this and they've done so just because of the changing nature of personal information 
that the federal government has to recognize for its own internal operations. And there are many, many requirements that federal government has with respect to protecting personal information. I could do an entire webinar about that. There's, there's that much. But the point is, is that PII really has become expanded to the point where we should, might as well just call it personal data, personal information. It's, it's a concept that's become so big that it's almost universally recognizable in all of our state level legislation, in our specific legislation for specific industries like the insurance industry and financial services. So that's just a, an example of how the concept of PII has evolved over time. And if we go to the next slide. Scott, I do have a question for you. Sure. Most of the time, PII requires combinations of data. How is that changing? Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny you mentioned that. I got this question yesterday. And yes, it does require combinations of data to make it useful, especially if you're a bad guy and you really want to go in and utilize it. Uh, the problem is that from an audit standpoint, just finding an isolated element of personal information, how we're defined, is enough to put it in scope if you have not, for example, encrypted it or otherwise have not done what you need to do. So uh, the problem is that from a, a operational standpoint, the bad guys usually need more than one element to make it useful. Now, it's not always the case. Some things like SSNs can pack a lot more danger, if you will. But as a practical matter, just having a single element can be enough to get you into trouble from a, a regulatory standpoint, just because the way the audit standards to the degree they exist are drafted. So uh, this is an, an interesting dichotomy because it's easy to say, well, if a bad guy finds one piece of information, they're not going to be able to do a lot with it. But that's not something that's going to necessarily pass muster with respect to an auditor. Also, remember that bad guys don't just hit one site. Office management budget got hit badly. So anyone that ever worked for the government or even applied for a job for the government is now presumably in the hands of bad guys. They can cross-reference that with other information they find, even if it's only certain pieces, and make use of it. So the net net of it is just because one element on your website may not be, or behind your firewall may not be relevant to a bad guy, combining that with one more, one or more will be. So that's why we have to always treat these single elements as just as important as multiple elements. So that's a long way of answering that question. Great, thank you. One more quick question before we move on. Sure. Would sure. an account number for a checking account alone be considered PII or NPI? Oh boy, I'm going to say yes. And here's the problem. You're saying, Scott, you're nuts. How can they marry that up with anything else? But if you look at how the law is written, some laws, like for example, the original California breach notification really required you to have that account number plus something else. But we're seeing laws move away from that, where they're just hitting individual account numbers, if you will, or individual elements of, of personal information and calling the, the loss of that something that violates the statute. So again, even though an account number logically by itself isn't going to get you anywhere, the problem is that it's easy enough to marry it up with other data you've stolen, if you're a bad guy, that is, to be able to manipulate it or, or to abuse it. That's what the position is of the legal frameworks we're working with. So even though, again, operationally, you're not going to get very far, as I said earlier, from a legal standpoint, you're likely going to be winding up in hot, hot water. And imagine there was a breach that happened at, at your, your FI, and the only thing that was retrieved and was put up on the internet was every single bank account number. Even if it, no one ever got compromised, you can imagine what, what a, a firestorm would kick up as a result of that. So you always have to think in those terms of, of how these elements collectively would create liability for your FI. Okay, so GDPR, if you've been on any of my previous presentations, you've seen upteen times the expanding definition of a personal data under GDPR. And here's what's remarkable about this is that, as I'll talk about in a minute, California has gone even past that, and New York State's even gone past that. So that's how fast we've come in a short time. Uh, so for GDPR, identification numbers, location data, yeah, old news, online identifiers, we'll talk about that in a minute, and then this idea that's still very ephemeral, physical, physiological, genetic, mental, economic, cultural, or social identity. What does that mean? I still can't tell you, folks. I've been asked this question many times in the past year. Still don't know what it means, but it can probably mean just about anything when someone violates the law. That's the problem. If we go to the next slide, we'll dig a little deeper into 
recital 30, which really is the key recital, believe it or not, in the whole GDPR, because it talks about devices, applications, tools, and protocols, which, as I've said, again, many, many times can mean anything, which means it puts so much data in scope that was not previously in scope, data that you may have collected routinely. I mean, think about it back in the 90s and 2000s when we were just vacuuming up all kinds of data uh, just as a culture whenever we were collecting it, just figuring we might use it someday. That's all now turned on its head because anything you collect now is personal information. So if you don't need it, it's better to get rid of it. Let's go to the next slide. And here's some examples. Before we go to examples, the, one of the questions I get is, hey, you know what, RFI doesn't do business in the EU, so who cares? And the fact of the matter is that your institution does, and here's why. Because if they are processing personal data on behalf of other FIs that do do business in the EU, then they're subject to the same law. So under Article 28, Sub 3, which is really the big one for data processors, the data controllers, the FIs that are ultimately on the hook for this, have to hold you the processor to the same standard that they're held to. And so that means that you have to become GDPR compliant insofar as you're processing personal data for these institutions. And this isn't theoretical. I worked on a project right before I joined the team here for an FI in the Midwest that had no ops in the EU, but had a customer for whom they processed all of their European data. So they were held to the same standard, standard contractually. So that's the idea is that, yeah, you don't do business per se overseas, but you're still gonna be held to the standard. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So expanding definition of PII under the CCPA, which uh, is currently my favorite law for, uh, for personal data protection, uh, for reasons that you'll see here. Anything that identifies, relates to, describes, links, linkable directly, indirectly with a consumer or a household. So it's not just consumers, but presumably your household, which could be if you're sending um, solicitations directly to a household now, now that's in scope as well. And if we go to the next slide, I'll give you some species of personal information under CCPA, which is, again, these things are just consistent throughout everything we're going to be doing here today. So unique personal identifier, we talked about that earlier. Online identifiers, I mentioned that. And if we go to the next slide, you're going to see another set of personal information that was borrowed from another law in California. So physical characteristics, your education, your employment, your employment history. Remember how I said that that was newly relevant? Here's why it's relevant here under CCPA. And you can see bank account number, credit card number, debit card number, any other financial information. So someone um, asked earlier, is it just a single number? Is that in scope? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now you might say, oh, well, Scott, you know what? Banks aren't subject to CCPA. We'll come to that. Let's go to the next slide. Protected classifications, so Title VII classifications, for example. Commercial information, so your interactions with websites, things that you've bought or things that you're planning on buying. Web search history, advertisement interactions. I mean, these are all things that you likely do as an FI just because you have this information, either you're marketing to folks or you're involved in commercial transactions and this data now is in scope. Let's go to the next slide. There's more, it's remarkable. So audio, electronic, visual, thermal olfactory. So presumably smells either about you or something of that nature, all in scope. Inferences drawn from this information. So you see that this has been expanded remarkably. This goes even beyond what the Europeans did. So uh, I'm happy to say we've un one up them in this category. Let's go to the next slide, we'll show you more. Now, someone asked uh, me on a previous call, financial institutions, they're exempt from CCPA, so I shouldn't care. Well. No, they're not, okay? There's a section here that says that this doesn't apply to personal information that is collected per GLBA. Okay, that's great, or the California equivalent. But what about all the other information? Okay, we talked about and reviewed GLBA information in the beginning, but we saw how much more information FIs are collecting. So if you have employees in California, that's in scope. Any kind of marketing beyond the very limited requirements that you have under GLBA for sharing with unaffiliated third parties, that's in scope. Your website visitors, that's in scope. There's a lot more that's in scope. So this idea that FIs are, are exempt, not the case at all. I've heard that and it's just not true. Let's uh, go one more here. And as I promised, New York has even outdone California. Now this is not law yet, this is being considered. But here's what's remarkable about this is look at all the things that qualify as personal information. 
okay? So address, phone, social security number, things that you would expect. But then you go to the next slide and it's, it really gets into the weeds. So sexual information about anything that's sexual in nature, okay? Race, ethnicity, political, religious. This is all really borrowed from GDPR. Professional or employment-related information. See how that keeps coming back up? And if we go to the next slide, it really gets in the weeds. So now your educational, your medical, financial, commercial, internet or mobile activity, okay? IP addresses, um, anything with your mobile devices. And then any of these categories as they pertain to the children of the consumer. So however many children you have, you're multiplying the information that's in scope. Now, again, this is not a law at the moment, but this is something that could easily be passed into law this session, or if not, it'll be raised next session. And the point is, is that the definition of personal information is expanding so rapidly that just about anything is turning into personal information. And I'm not being cynical here. I mean, you can see it with your own eyes that this is just the direction we're going in, unfortunately. Abby, I'm going to stop there. Any questions or comments about anything that we, we've spoken of thus far? Yes, there is one more question. This person's assumed where there are joint accounts, all of the data defined as NPI or PII extends to all account holders. Do you think that's an accurate assumption to make? Yes, it's a safe one, if nothing else. Other questions? Unless specifically included in California law, would any of the New York proposed laws be applicable outside the state of New York? Yes, because if you're conducting business state of New York, then they're going to be applicable, which then raises the question, presumably you're going to be doing them in, in city of New York, which means that you're going to have to get a license, which means that you're subject to Part 500, which means that you are going to, unless exempted by, by the law in New York, you're going to already be subject to Part 500, which is so expansive that it's, it's going to create a lot of work for you regardless. So even if you weren't subject to S224, however it's implemented, NYC Part 500 is going to, uh, to likely capture you anyway, and that's a project in and of itself. They may include this data that you're seeing here under S224 and wrap that in statewide for any institutions that do business there. I don't know where this proposed bill is going, but I would look for that whenever it does pass. If it does pass, I'll dig into it and see if there's going to be an exemption or they're going to just lump that into the Part 500 requirements. Great. Thanks. I think that's all the questions we have for now. Okay, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand things off to Mike. And Mike, you can give your perspective on this. And by the way, if, in case anyone's wondering, no, we're not related unless you go way back. So I just thought I'd uh, I'd share that. So Mike, why don't you take it away? Sure. So uh, thanks, Scott. So that was a really good overview, I think, of where PII is going and uh, where the, uh, the legal perspective is headed. And I think I agree with pretty much everything he said. I think it's only a matter of time before we see this in a lot more states. I was actually just doing research on this not too long ago, and I mean, just the plurality of states are starting to look at this, if not already passed legislation. So I think it's definitely wise to get ahead of the ball. So a little bit about DynTech. We are an enterprise consulting and integration firm. I head up our security and automation practice. We also work uh, across all of digital infrastructure, uh, modern workplace, data center, cloud, and all services of that nature. Next slide. Just a little bit about who we are. Again, security and automation, we feel really go hand in hand. And we approach uh, the problems that we solve from, uh, from an architectural perspective, also from an integration perspective, and from, from an advisory capacity as well. So we try to put all of these things together and then use automation as kind of a glue that brings things together. So we're not necessarily uh, just interested in uh, delivering a particular solution it's really more about how you tie that all together and how you make things work more efficiently if you want to go into the next slide enough about uh, just about us um, so let's start talking about the fun stuff we're going to start talking about things that maybe some of you may be familiar with maybe some of you aren't but we just want to get everyone on the same level and talk about some best practices for how you start to manage these, these challenges from an architectural perspective and more from the technology side of the house. So we start with the idea of three-line defense. A lot of you may be familiar with this. Of course, at the core, we have all the protected data that we're interested in securing, whether it be PII, PCI, PHI, whatever the case. And then on top of that, we start to layer controls around it. 
And the three lines basically refer to everything we do from the micro to the macro in terms of cybersecurity and risk. So we start with our first line, which are our traditional cybersecurity operators, people who are the hands on the keyboard, so to speak, people responding to incidents, people actually first line responsible for defending that data and those assets. But then that needs to be informed by someone else. We can't just have security being in its own tower or its own silo. So really the best way to approach that is for the organizational risk management or compliance team to be the second line of defense, to dictate the policies, to dictate the classifications, to understand where the vulnerabilities are. We spend a lot of time in security talking about indicators of compromise, trying to find out where bad things are, trying to find out where we've been hit, where we've been breached. Really, what we need to also be looking at and where the risk management function comes in is in looking for indicators of exposure. So where could we be vulnerable? What risks are we accepting? What risks are we avoiding? What risks are we ultimately mitigating? And that's actually what we're going to tell the security operations people uh, what to be doing. So we're looking at risk in aggregate for the organization. And then on top of that, there's an internal audit function that basically goes and pushes back against both previous lines and validates what you're doing, making sure that you're in compliance where you need to be, making sure ultimately that your user population knows what it needs to do, and makes your organization more secure by default. So a lot of larger organizations, of course, will have this uh, set up under a CIO or a CISO, and each one is its own team with people on each. But even a smaller uh, organization can still do this from a functional perspective, as long as there are people dedicated to these functions and performing them in a way that's organized that each line watches the next line before it. Next slide. So this, uh, this is an interesting slide. This is what I call the digital identity crisis. And identity is really where we start. We talk about how we go about securing our data, actually. So on the left, you know, are just a small handful of examples of where identity is introduced. And if you look at a typical enterprise environment, it's not uncommon to see north of 500 different applications deployed in the environment. Now, of course, each of them has their own security, has permissions, can be controlled, can be mitigated. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of overhead. And of course, there are the shadow IT functions, the applications that you may not even be aware are there the applications that you know are there but you can't control, the things that people are just bringing through the door because they have their own devices and that's just how we work these days. What's interesting about that though is now one out of three data breaches somehow involves uh, a shadow IT component, which is actually pretty scary because that represents still a very significant visibility gap for a lot of security teams. And then of course, most recent figures cost per record about $225. That's not necessarily the value of your data on the dark web. That's just if you look in aggregate the per capita cost of what happens when a data breach occurs in responding, remediating, communications, notifications, all the things you have to do and spend on ultimately to mitigate those breaches. And uh, you know, unfortunately as an industry, the time is still not great. It's still about five to six months before these breaches are uncovered. In some cases, it's years people are dwelling on the network. And then once discovered, we're still seeing anywhere between a month to two months to actually respond and remediate and contain these incidents. So very significant. So uh, next slide. So we start by looking at identity. And identity is really the core. A lot of people, when they approach this idea of data protection, they start from trying to understand what's wrong, what's bad, what, are, what, what do we need to be looking for. Really, where the smart place to start is, is by understanding what's good. And the only way to understand what good is, is to start by understanding what everyone is supposed to be doing. So the first step, really, is establishing complete identity of everybody, everyone on the network that's supposed to be there, that's supposed to be interfacing with you. Every single person should have a functional role. And we do that by basically going to each uh, business unit and understanding what they do, what are the roles that the people working in those business units are performing day to day. And out of that, we build personas, which are essentially a package of entitlements to different softwares, not just from the application level of you 
know, person A is entitled to uh, use an application, it may in fact and often is the case that person A and person B both are entitled to access a particular application, but one person needs a different level of access. Great example for a financial institution is uh, someone who is a financial advisor in a branch versus someone who works in the call center. Both of them may need to, uh, to interface with a customer's account. One of them needs to be able to see a lot more detail than the other. So we handle that through these kinds of personas at both the application and the data level. Now what's really also critical here is that we establish a single source of truth for identity. And whatever that is, it really doesn't matter. You know, a lot of people, there are commercial tools, there are in-house developed products. At the end of the day, what really matters is that you have a single source of truth for identity within the organization that can then feed other applications or other sources of identity. A lot of people may be familiar with Active Directory. It's kind of the de facto identity source in a lot of places. But really, we want to be feeding that from some master control system that can also define personas for our mainframes, if we have some, for our Linux environments, for anything that's not within Active Directory, or for our SaaS applications or our cloud infrastructure. Um, so from identity, we're going to move into visibility. Um, so once we know what everyone is supposed to be doing, we start to look at what's actually going on. So we want to know all the applications in use on our network. And I mean all the applications. We want to know all the shadow applications. We want to know what everyone is doing day to day. A big note here is to inspect encrypted traffic if you're not doing that already. Between half to two thirds of the traffic on the network now uses SSL. If you cannot inspect encrypted traffic, that means you are blind to half to two thirds of what's going on in the environment. So we want to know everything. We don't want to make any really judgments yet. We just want to understand what's out there so we can accurately control it. And then the last thing in visibility is to establish non-repudiation. So we want to tie the visibility back to our source of identity so that we can see not only everything that is going on, but we want to be able to accurately and irrefutably tie that back to specific users. A big common pitfall here, of course, is the shared account. We have a lack of licenses, so multiple people share a login, or there's a shared administrative account. Situations like that open you up to a problem because uh, since it's a shared account, you can't really ever definitively say who did this if the account is used in a negligent or a malicious way. So then from uh, visibility, we move into classification, and this is really the meat of it for uh, the data protection. But first, we of course, knowing who is supposed to be where, seeing what's going on. Now with that information, having an inventory of all of our sensitive data. Not only having an inventory of our data, a lot of places do have paper policy in place on data classification, but now what's really more important than ever is to translate that into the digital world and be able to persistently tag that data so that we can observe where it goes and how it moves. And we often hear data called the lifeblood of the organization, but it's pretty shocking actually how few organizations understand fully how that circulates around the, the enterprise as a body, if you will. And then from there, the last step in the, uh, in the governance cycle is, uh, is orchestration. So being able to take the business and technology processes and put them together. And one of the big fall downs, maybe the biggest fall down for security for data protection is that once security becomes an obstacle, it becomes something that gets circumvented in the name of efficiency. Um, so we want to be able to do this transparently. We want to be able to do it behind the scenes in an automated way. And that's really where this comes in. So being able to routinely reconcile what we expect to see with what is actually out there, being able to routinely go in and verify where data is, and importantly, if data is somewhere it's not supposed to be. We want this to happen on an automated basis because, quite frankly, there's no way any team of any organization size can really keep up with this on a, on a manual basis. And then, of course, we also want to be able to establish metrics for performance and assess those uh, regularly. So once we have that out of the way, we talk about uh, the architecture of what a secure network looks like and what we need to move towards. So in a very simplified, and I mean, this may be the most absurdly simplified understanding of, of a network, you have what's outside the organization and you have what's inside the organization. And the old mantra has always been trust but verify. Um, so you're inside. We just want to know what's going on. We want to put up some controls. But for the most part, we have all these systems and databases and people. And we put access control lists in place, we put rules in place, 
But uh, for the most part, the degree of visibility and security within the organization is usually significantly less than outside the organization coming in. So what we try to move more toward is a, is a zero trust architecture. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, Abby. And some of you may be familiar with zero trust, but basically the assumption is that nothing is trusted and nothing is implicit. So we want to make sure that everything is defined based on the personas that we use, based on the functional business roles that we've already defined. We now want to start incorporating our systems and ultimately our data into as small a perimeter as possible. And the only things that really need to get in and out of those are the people who fit the persona. So somebody tries to access an application, uh, they should be able to go back to their single source of truth or identity, understand what their, their persona is, what their entitlements are, and get to where they need to go. Now, of course, the situation always occurs where you know two people may have slightly different job functions. Two people have the same role, the same title, but person A does a couple things that person B doesn't do, or person B occasionally covers a duty for someone in a different department, or whatever the case is, and that's fine. Those are just what we call change controls, changes of authority, changes to entitlement. For the most part, we don't want to get too crazy on personas because then we obviously end up in a place where we have 10,000 personas and that's unmanageable. So we, there is some process where the security team is involved in managing this, but ultimately we want to break it down into small components as we can so that that sensitive data is contained and only the people who explicitly need access to it can get to it. And we know with certainty that it's not leaving uh, those locations. On the flip side, Doing this also helps contain problems when and if they occur. So if something is breached in a particular database, because that is isolated, the potential for that threat to move what we call laterally or east-west across the network is significantly reduced by it by virtue of it already being uh, contained. So uh, next slide. So then questions to ask. And this is, this is basically my version of the if you get nothing else out of this, please take this with you. Four questions we always want to be asking about our data that can be informed by the identity principles, by zero trust architecture, by all the things we've talked about. You know, can I see where critical data is at all times, or sensitive data? Is all of the data uh, in the organization classified? Is it assessed for risk on a regular basis? Am I aligning that with a legitimate business or regulatory need? As Scott mentioned, we're at a point now where really, if you don't need a particular category of information, why keep it? We're at a point now where a lot of people don't really look at the data they're keeping via backup, for instance, too. How much of that do we need to keep? For how long? The more data we keep, ultimately, since PII keeps expanding, uh, data kind of starts to become a liability. The more that we keep, the bigger our, our attack surface becomes, the more likely at some point some of that information is going to be compromised somehow. So we want to limit that. And then ultimately, um, how do you verify that the data is being handled and processed properly? So uh, Abby, if you want to go to the next slide, we'll tie this all back together into a data protection life cycle. So we go back to the three lines of defense we talked about in the beginning, starting with data classification on the left, which is a risk management function to establish what the classification should be, what the legitimate uses are, who are the, uh, the legitimate identity personas that we need to establish on the network, and then what our policies are going to be as far as data privacy go. That goes into the, the uh, discovery process, which is also ultimately a risk management function. We need to understand where our data is. We need to understand the indicators of exposure around those locations, and we need to align that data with defined personas. Also really important is we need to reconcile that data. Um, oftentimes, the problem with uh, with data is that we put it in applications that are secure, but then you know the people who work with that data, in the name of efficiency, are cutting and pasting that data, and then we find it in all sorts of places that it's not supposed to be. So getting to a point where we know that okay, we, we reconciled all of this, and all of the data is where it's supposed to be, is a much better place to start than trying to go straight to protection um, and then running into all sorts of problems because data is just all over. So once we have the classification and uh, the discovery done, we can go into the zero trust kind of architecture, apply those principles, the at rest controls. This is a lot where automation comes in and segmentation. This is your security operations people. These are your first line of defenders um, who are doing this and building this. These are your engineers. 
who are also enforcing it. Um, we're talking more in motion controls. Something that's also really relevant to take a look at is behavioral analysis. Now that we know what good is, it should be very simple to see what bad looks like. Um, just like your body has an immune system, you don't need a signature to tell you that you're sick, you just feel sick, you know you're off baseline. That's really important to look at uh, because so many of these data breaches are facilitated by what we call low and slow attacks, um, things that traditional technology cannot find because it's just not built for it. Um, so really being able to understand behavior, understand what good is, and then by deviation from that, we can see what bad is. And here too, we want to be able to automate what we call changes of authority. So if somebody needs to add or remove an entitlement, we want that to be as automated as possible. Great example, someone moves from department A to department B or from role A to role B. We want to strip all their previous entitlements away, um, assign them a new identity persona, and therefore we know that they're not accumulating privilege as they move around the environment. Um, from there, you go into the, uh, the third line of defense, the audit uh, function, where we're trying to really establish and track what our performance indicators around this enforcement and discovery are. Um, we want to be able to identify the gaps. We want to be able to automate that monitoring. And then finally, we want to tie that into awareness. User awareness is really, ultimately, you know, the, the holy grail of all of this because you know, the best technology in the world cannot save you from an untrained user clicking on something they shouldn't click on. The better trained your users are, the more routinely you, you assess their familiarity with security procedures, the more routinely you do what we call tabletop exercises where we're simulating these sorts of incidents, the better informed your users are going to be, the more they're going to see why this data protection matters. And then once you marry the business and technology functions together, really you're going to ultimately reduce risk across the board. And then as new data enters the organization, um, it's more likely to be protected um, than if any of the users were not being, being informed by all these, uh, these metrics. With that, I'm gonna pass it back over to Scott. We'll talk a little bit about what a data inventory looks like. Wonderful, wonderful, thank you, Mike. And if we have some time at the end, I definitely want to revisit some of the things that uh, you just discussed. But before we do that, data inventories, this is something I get a lot of questions about, about what should a data inventory look like? What information does it contain? Why do we care above and beyond what's required under, say, the GDPR, for example? Really, what's so important about a data inventory is, and Mike, you mentioned this earlier about having single sources of truth. This is a prime example of that. Uh, in the sense that you have to be able to have a, a reference document that you can use for everything. You use this both as an exercise in finding personal data, whether you're conducting interviews or using technology to go suss that out, but really getting the idea of the purpose of the processing, why you're doing it in the first place, what applications are being fed by the application in question. A lot of times, especially with HR data, you'll find that HR systems are feeding into other systems and those systems are feeding yet into other systems and you have with this idea of application chaining where personal information is being passed down uh, downstream and it's easy to lose track of and so one of the big benefits of an inventory is finding all of this data finding all the ways it's used and then getting an idea of whether if third parties have access to it and they have license to use it are they using it properly so this all uh, inures the benefit of, of all of us here to have a data inventory also, the purpose of the processing is critical because in many cases, if something goes wrong, the regulatory authority is going to demand to know why you have the data and what you were doing with it. Um, this was an example of Equifax in the UK when the uh, information commissioner's office asked about this. Uh, why did you have a certain kind of data? They couldn't, they couldn't explain it and that did not, uh, did not bear well on them. So data inventories are crucial for so many reasons and they're feeders for other things. They're feeders or for example, your data breach notification program, your incident response program, they feed into your data protection officer's position and, and his or her projects. They feed into security, they feed into so many different things. That's why having that single source of truth and having it constantly updated is so important. I don't know if you wanna weigh in on that. I'm sure you've got uh, your experiences with it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the problem this becomes the, the overhead in managing this stuff in my experience. You know, different people often have uh, different functions. They may or may not interface. I've encountered uh, not so much in financial, although I have seen it, uh, but in a lot of sectors, I've encountered places where you know, the information security team 
has literally asked me if, if they should be consulting with the risk management team uh, on a data protection plan. And it's kind of shocking, but yes, of course. I mean, that kind of goes back to the whole integrated three-line defense, being able to really see it and have that pushback if necessary, but also be able to have the assurance that where everything, um, where it is, you know, why it's there, do we need it, and how does that ultimately align you know, back to the business? Very important. Second thing I wanted to bring to your attention is this idea of data classification. Sometimes I get folks that say, well, do we do data classification first? Do we do data discovery first? And really, they're, they're two separate projects, but they're tightly related. And it's not a question of which one you do first. Pick one and do it, but you're ultimately going to need both. And this is based on my own experience. And to your point about needing other advice, whether it's risk management or legal or, or HR, when you're uh, developing a data classification schema, so you're dividing up all the different categories of, of personal information, you really need the input of so many different departments. You, you need legal, you need HR, you need the lines of business that are actually using the data. And you need to have this in a committee so everyone is, has agreement as to how to classify, categorize certain kinds of information and what kind of controls need to be put in place. So this is just, just an example of that. I don't know what your experience has been, but that was definitely a, a team effort. And the first schema that I developed took almost eight or nine months to, uh, to develop and to get through and get approved. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I just, I would just echo that uh, again. I mean, really understanding the functional roles of people, very, very important. That can go either way, though. A lot of people, they get too lost in the weeds and uh, it becomes impossible to manage. A lot of people, they go very broad. They, they have a persona for just an HR employee. That's not really uh, sufficient either. Um, so we want to be able to really get granular. Um, and it's important that those personas reflect both the applications in use and the data. Because as I said, it's often the case that people have very similar roles, but they do some things differently, or they may be two completely different roles that still need access to the same sensitive data. So really, you know, knowing that identity, it's only possible if you're aligned via a committee approach to all the different business units and understand what good looks like in the beginning. Agreed. Let's go to summary and conclusions. Before we do, Abby, any remaining questions that we have? Yes, we have a few. Michael, this one is for you. So in reference to the shadow IT elements that you were referring to earlier, can you please define what you mean by shadow? Sure. It's a common term, but it's still, uh, I guess, gaining uh, momentum. The idea of shadow IT is that you have uh, three categories of applications on your network at any given time. You have your sanctioned corporate applications, the things that the company purchases and issues and licenses. You have unsanctioned, which are the things that people are using on their own devices, or they're fairly innocuous things, but they're still a source of risk, you know, like, a, like a Google Drive or a Dropbox or a OneDrive might be a, an example. Shadow IT refers to applications that uh, you don't know are there, that people are bringing in and installing either on their own personal device, on your network, or on your uh, corporate-issued endpoint that you don't want there. A great example, uh, number one example there is probably PDF converters. A lot of people frequently either need to take a PDF and put it into an editable format, or they want to take a, uh, an editable document and put it into a PDF format. There are a myriad of tools that get downloaded for this. There are also now uh, services online that will do you upload a file and you get a PDF to download. And an end user doesn't necessarily think about the consequences of that, that the data actually goes out of the organization to a website, is converted, and then comes back down. But what happens to that data? So a lot of these, these applications, they can often introduce risk. Obviously, there's other things like, you know, the, the, the person on the network using BitTorrent to download music off the company website, or excuse me, the company bandwidth, and on and on and on. But basically, shadow is a blanket term for anything that uh, is not sanctioned by the organization that you wouldn't want running on the network if you knew it was there. Awesome, thank you. So one more question for both of you guys. Could you comment on how data retention and disposal fit into the overall data protection? Sure, I'll start with that one. Scott, if you want to chime in. So really important because in a lot of cases, there is a requirement to keep data for a certain amount of time. In terms of how it factors into data protection, in general, I always advise that people treat their backup data exactly the same 
as their live data. A common thing, you know, unfortunately, in cybersecurity is that you know, defenders don't often think like attackers. But often cases, it's very easy for a malicious actor to go after backup data because it's not treated with the same level of security as, as live data. It's very important to keep in mind that anything you have is, is potentially a target. In terms of availability, you know, we always recommend a 321 strategy. So, uh, you know, three different copies of uh, sensitive data, uh, two on redundant uh, types of media or locations, and then at least one copy in a non-addressable place. So an offline location or a cold vault or somewhere where it can't be accessed. But I would say following a good backup regimen and, and, and making sure that backups are protected at the same level of, uh, of importance as live data, uh, very important. And then, of course, don't hold on to data longer than you have to. We, uh, we often talk about minimizing our threat surface. A big part of that is the more data you have, the bigger your threat surface is. If you don't need to keep it, don't keep it. Uh, there's two separate issues that are related to this. One is, is archiving versus backup. When you think about backup, you think about disaster recovery. And I get this question a lot. What happens, do, do data protection laws apply to data that is on our backup tapes, for example, or other backup media? And the answer is we don't know, in the sense that, that the laws, I've yet to see one that talks about how backups are addressed with respect to personal data. Keep in mind that if you restored a backup, say you had a disaster, restored a backup, and you had data that was previously requested to be deleted, and in fact you did, you're going to have to re-delete that. So that's why it probably makes sense to keep relatively frequent backups so that you don't have to re-delete data that you've already had to delete because that's going to create some headaches for you. But that's a distinction between that and archive data where perhaps you're archiving things for legal reasons. Perhaps there is a legal hold or there's upcoming litigation and you're taking certain kinds of data and archiving it because you, you think it's likely going to be implicated in a, an investigation or a lawsuit or what have you. That's a different function. So I, I want to make sure people understand that dichotomy because otherwise you may wind up holding way too much information that you're using your, your backups essentially as an archive, which I, I don't think is necessarily a good idea. There's just too much exposure there for you. And then uh, the larger question too is what happens if I'm told by a data protection authority to delete something, but I have to hold it for data retention purposes, which is really a species of archiving? Who wins? And the answer is it's a great question. It, that's something that you have to pull legal into and see if there's a way to, to resolve that because that it hasn't come up in my experience with any frequency, but it's, it's a feared event that everyone has. And I think that uh, addressing it ahead of time by calling the legal and saying, suppose the European Information Commissioner's Office in the UK, for example, demands we delete this. What do we do? This data is on hold for, for litigation and having them work with the um, supervisory authority to see if you can come to a compromise. Okay, Anything great. else after? We received a question, but you just answered it. So I think we're covered okay. for now. All right. Thank you. Well, then let's uh, summarize and offer some conclusions, and um, we'll uh, let everyone uh, wrap up for this session. There is a quiet revolution going on at the state level in data protection. And if you've seen uh, previous webinars that we've done, you know that last year there was about a dozen or so states that made some substantial changes to data protection laws, both privacy and security. We're seeing that again this year, and above and beyond CCPA, we're seeing other states that are considering legislation, and I suspect that several of them will pass the, the bills. There's about 15, maybe 14 states that are doing it so right now. So we're going to see much of this year what we saw last year. So personal data that's not covered by GLBA is constantly expanding. So the idea that I'm exempt from certain laws because it's GLBA data, it's very, very limited. GLBA, while it's it was good at the time it was written. So much more data has being created out there. And as a consequence, you have to be cognizant of that in your data protection program. So get started with your data inventory. And don't assume the federal government's going to come and bail us all out. Um, I can tell you that uh, at this point, it's very unlikely there will be a federal data privacy law this year, and certainly perhaps not even next year. So um, let's not uh, put too much hope in that. Mike, any um, final thoughts from your perspective? Uh, no, I mean, I think uh, I pretty much uh, echo everything you just said. I think it's just important to reiterate um, how uh, we need to get more and more the risk management people, the, the, the privacy, the legal people in the same room as the technology people and then work together 
to go to the organization in, in a broader sense and really align with each of those business units and understand, you know, how we all need to work together to make this reality. Wonderful. If that's the case, then um, I'm going to thank all of you for attending. Again, if there's any questions that were not answered, and even in the questions that were answered, um, I'll put them up on the blog in about a week or so, and take some time to, to review things and to get everything wrapped up. But you should also have access to this uh, webcast in about a week as well. So thank you all. Uh, thank you, Mike, for joining us here today, and we'll see you next time.